Yeah, Genesis 1, the beginning of the world. Now, create, accounts of creation, the beginning, are not told at the beginning. In a sense, by definition, they can't be. I mean, nobody's there, you know, days one, two, three, four, five. Um, and all cultures have accounts of creation and what happens at the beginning, but they're told from, as it were, uh, somewhere down the line, i.e. the world that is set in motion in this account is depicted, envisaged, told from a perspective long subsequent to that, i.e. when it's already an established fact, so to speak. And one of the things that you do in a creation story is, as it were, to try to capture fundamental things about the nature of the world we live in. Um, and uh, in this case, it is first and foremost that the world is God's world, made by God, and the object of God's delight. Um, each day God sees what he's made and it's good, it's good, it's very good. Um, where the good is not, I think, a, a sort of a moral judgment, you know, it's, it's morally good rather than corrupt or evil. Um, it's it's uh, the person who's done a job of work and then looks at it and says, nice one, I like it, it's great. Um, and the world is portrayed as, as I say, God's world and the world in which God delights. And so I think the, the first and foremost thing for the reader is that this gives us a vision of the world as a place which, if God delights in, so should we, his creatures and especially insofar as we seek to, to know and be responsive to our Creator, we need, in a sense, that perspective on the world. Not least because, as much of the rest of the Old Testament makes clear, and as everybody knows, the world is in fact a very complex, difficult, and often painful place. Many people lose joy and delight in life and the world. They become depressed, despairing. Um, what is there to live for? Why live? The world simply is a place of things that negate life. Um, but Genesis 1 is an overture um, that should, as it were, be somewhere where the imagination can graze and linger as, you know, in a favourite picture or poem or piece of music, something which sets keynotes that need to be taken on board. Um, and first and foremost, that it is good, an object of a place of God's delight. Um, whatever the difficulties, that is fundamental. Now, Within that general frame of reference, there, there, are, there are many different ways of reading Genesis 1. Um, and I think it depends to some extent on the, on the context. Because um, you can, as it were, imagine different contexts. A lot of modern biblical scholarship has asked about who wrote the text, when and where. So one of the contexts that has been proposed for, for reading the text is it's uh, the best guess for its context of composition. Um, sometime in the 6th century BC, the Jews in exile, um, and therefore, as it were, we should be thinking about Jews in exile, um, focusing uh, a new understanding of God and their identity, in observing the Sabbath that's important at the end of Genesis 1 and so on, um, as sort of a way of reading the text and making sense of it. Now, that's fair enough. Only, um, the text itself says nothing about Babylon or <laughs> exile. Um, the perspective of the text in its literary context is 
the omniscient narrator giving us God's perspective on the world. Um, where it seems to me we're not in being invited by the text itself to think of a context of composition, 6th century Babylon or wherever, um, but we're being invited to think about the world um, as seen by God. Now it seems to me it's not that one's the right way and the other's the wrong way of reading, they're both possible ways of reading the text. Um, but if the basic principle is, you know, you, to understand a text you must read it in context, the question then becomes, which context? Is it the supposed context of composition, context of origin, which with most things in the Old Testament we don't really know, though our guesses are, I hope, intelligent and informed guesses, but they're not, you know, nothing is really certain about when the texts were written, um, or is it the, the literary, the canonical context of the book in itself where, as I say, we're being invited not to think of any particular period of history but the world as a whole as God sees it and by implication as we should see it also. So there's more than one way of reading the text and I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, of the many things that are important in Genesis 1, I suppose the most enduringly significant, other than the notion of the world as, as good, as a place of delight, is human beings made in the image of God. Um, this has been influential and significant in ways that are impossible to to quantify. It's been so huge um, because it obviously gives a, a dignity, a significance, a meaning to human life made in the image of God um, that might not be the case otherwise. Now scholars have obviously down the ages asked what exactly does it mean to be in the image of God and the short answer is it's not entirely clear. Um, it can be read in, in more than one way, it's not entirely straightforward, and yet on any reckoning um, it gives great value and dignity to human life. And that's important not least because one of the things that happens when you have a culture like ours which ceases to believe in God is that therefore your understanding of what it means to be human changes also. Um, lots of people say, well, why believe in God? You know, why does it matter whether you believe in a big sort of invisible entity somewhere up in the sky or whatever, you know, and if you cease to believe in that, you haven't lost anything. Um, you know, nothing changes, so to speak. Um, very few things could be further from the biblical understanding where an understanding of God and the world as God's world and humans as in the image of God means that if there is no God um, then what it means to be human changes also and that the dignity, the value, the meaning that can be found in life um, if you believe that we're in the image of God um, that goes. So our own understanding of what it means to be human, what it means to live well, what should we live for, and so on, all that changes if we don't, as it were, see ourselves as in the image of God and all the ways in which the, the Bible as a whole sort of fills that out. Um, and one of the things that's often been raised in recent years is that you know, humans aren't the only animate creation, you know, the, the whole world matters, there are animals and so on, and that too is significant. Nonetheless, humans are given a dignity and a vocation, as it were, to be God's uh, a 